and we should be live. So welcome everybody to the Shadow Boat Hangout with Lorraine Margeson. Uh, my name is Leonard Schmiggy. I'm at St. Pete Poles where I do sales and we have two of the area's best local bloggers with us today and hopefully some other members of the press will also join in if we get a chance. We're expecting a visit from Janelle Irwin of WMNF and uh, possibly some others if they can make it after their other regular scheduled broadcasts. Uh, starting from the picture on the left is Gene Webb, and I'll let him introduce himself after a minute, and then I'm speaking now, Lorraine Margeson, our candidate for District 2 for St. Petersburg, Florida City Council. The election is November 5th in exactly a week. And then we have Phil Amon on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, why don't, Gene, why don't you start, and I will uh, just let you all uh, talk without interfering. Um, Gene Allen. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, and first off, let me just thank uh, uh, Leonard and the folks up at St. Pete Polls for putting this together. This is the first one of these, and, uh, and hopefully there will be many more, and a large number of participants get an opportunity to uh, be part of this. My name is Gene Webb. You can find me in uh, St. Pete Patch, posting as Doc Webb, and at my personal blog, uh, Bay Post Internet. And I'm really looking forward this afternoon to uh, having this conversation with Lorraine. What I'm going to do is, if you've been following my blog, there we put five questions to all of the candidates. We're going to go back over those today with Lorraine and get her answers to some of the really pressing issues here in uh, this St. Pete election. Okay. Hi, I'm Phil Ammon. I write for uh, St. Peter's blog, Peter Scorch's uh, blog. I also have my own personal blog at uh, HR News Daily, um, and I follow state and local politics. And um, I'm going. I have a few questions of my own. But, All right, why don't you guys just go ahead and, um, uh, Lorraine, you, it's, uh, you're up. Just a quick introduction of yourself, and then we'll, we'll have these guys ask you some questions. Lorraine Martison, uh, candidate for District 2 Council seat. I'm a long-term uh, neighborhood activist, uh, public safety activist, and most recently and most poignantly environmental activist. So I know all the players around the city, the county, a lot of them at the state level. And um, I finally decided that it's time for me to try to legislate instead of just fighting legislation. I have a lot to offer, and I'm ready to go. Well, for me, November 5th. Well, very good. Uh, let, me, uh, let me begin uh, with uh, the first question. And one of the things that has been a, a real uh, hot issue in this election is uh, crime and public safety in general. One of the questions that I posed to the candidates was this, specifically with details, what would you do throughout the entirety of St. Pete to reduce crime and make the city safe for its citizens? Well, by the way, I'd like to mention that my opponent never did answer any of the questions. Just wanted right. to highlight that. Um, of course, uh, a, a big part of my uh, platform has been to restore community policing in our city. Now, um, some folks refer to that as political policing, but I know that it's really an important component to reinvigorating and hopefully strengthening our neighborhood associations and neighborhoods in general. I have heard it all over the city, that lack of, you know, companionship in a sense, of knowing who your police officers are. And in the old days when we had a strong community policing network, and that's when I started uh, the Crime Watch on 34th Street Court, or when I lived in District 8, which I lived in that district for 15 years, I started 34th Street uh, Crime Watch as well as helped uh, create actually the first neighborhood team, the 34th Street Neighborhood Association team. And I'll tell you that, you know, we knew we had usually, we had 12 to 16 officers that were the community policing force in that district. So each district had that, you know, number of officers particularly devoted to community policing. And it was tremendous because any day of the week you could be out on the street and you'd see one of the police officers that you knew. 
And then when it came time for uh, you know some uh, more severe policing uh, for an issue, you know sting operations and so forth, you would have that same group that was not only more of a unified group or a team, shall we say, together. They were also a unified team with us citizens, and it made such a difference in trust in getting things done. Uh, those officers would know if there was like a, a, a teenager or someone who's working at McDonald's or what have you and knew they were supposed to be walking on the street at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they'd know where there were uh, families that were having, you know, issues with the family, uh, where there could be real problems. It just made such a difference to have, they were like your family, like your neighbor. So th I think that's the number one thing that we have to do. And yes, that's going to either take some shifting of funds or some finding of a little bit more funds because there are some good uh, other teams that have been formed in the interim since we became the community service organization, uh, essentially is what it's called. And so you don't want to really detract from some of those good targeting teams for certain kinds of crime issues. Uh, so I'm not posing that. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of officers about this. As long as you know, they still have some of those other special teams and then we add back into the community policing team so that there are solid teams in each, dis each district, I think we're going to have a lot healthier relationship. And needless to say, in South St. Pete, and I've been there quite a lot to many meetings and meeting with many folks there, because I did a lot of work years and years ago, probably for five years, in working on public safety in the community, with the community, Southside, Child's Park, Palmetto Park, Midtown, which is now Midtown. Um, and again, that kind of you know touchy feely. You know who the officers are, basically, who are going to be in your neighborhood every week. That would so much benefit Southside as well. Uh, I'm also a supporter of civil citations instead of hard time for low-level drug crimes. Uh, that would be another uh, neighborhood building and community trust factor, at least in our Southside areas. And there's lots more, but let's just say we need a real look-see and re-examination of our policing, policing management strategies, and absolutely we need CPOs like we used to have back on the beat. Great. Hey, Phil, you want to go uh, any follow-up or question? Yeah, I'd like to change the subject to uh, transportation. Um, first of all, are you in favor of the uh, Greenlight Pinellas Initiative. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, now I know the last um, the last time I had seen you and um, Jim Kennedy Kennedy talk, uh, he was talking about the improvements on Gandhi Boulevard. What are your opinions of that? Because that is that's probably going to be the biggest transportation project in your district. Um, how do you feel about that? And what uh, what changes, if you were if you were able to, what changes would you make? Well, the flyovers that you're talking about, isn't that basically a county FDOT project? Uh, I mean, it's not city-driven, is it? I, I don't believe it's city-driven, but there is a city component to it, um, and it's not just it's not just it's the improvements of Gandhi Boulevard throughout, where where they're actually talking about an overpass at Gandhi and Fourth Street. And I just wanted to get your your. Uh, I think that I think it sounds around. like a very good idea. I frankly speaking, I have not studied that plan strictly because I believe it's mostly FDOT and county, so right. it wouldn't be something that I could reasonably put on. And and let me give you an example of why when my opponent talks about these things, he really doesn't have as much power as he poses. As an example, the San Martin Bridge. I was at a Riviera Bay Neighborhood uh, Association meeting where he told the association that, oh, I've moved up the timetable and the San Martin Bridge is going to be improved and blah, 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 blah. And I immediately knew that was a county project. That's not a city project. So I went ahead and called the county. And I said, is it, uh, what uh, has Mr. Kennedy done to improve, move forward, or do anything of any impactful nature on this future project for the San Martin Bridge? The answer, nothing. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can, and I would urge you to go ahead and make those same phone calls if you feel that I'm in error and pointing that out.
but he made promises to that community. I called the county, who I know is actually running the project, actually has the people analyzing, you know, the water quality to the construction, to, you know, what it needs to be when it gets built. It's exactly on the same timetable as it's been, 2020. They won't even start looking at, you know, kind of a plan, in other words, construction plans until 2017. And my opponent told that neighborhood association he had moved it ahead and probably start getting built in 2015, 2016. That is inaccurate, and it's not fair to tell citizens something that is not going to be true. So again, that's why I have not severely examined the Gandhi, because there have been many other issues that were general issues for the city, and of course I'm running, I did not run in the primary, so I will be honest and say that I haven't looked closely at that, but I bet you, you know, there's a lot more county control and FDOT control over what will happen. And not to say that a city council person cannot, you know, be in discussions and have commentary on it, but it is not like my opponent is running that show. Okay, and that's simply why, and I have not examined it closely, and I'll be honest with you. Okay, okay. Well, just to follow up then, uh, just transportation in general, because uh, your, your district is one of the, one of the most widespread districts on that. How do you feel about the improvements that are suggested in Greenlight Pinellas? Oh, fantastic. I mean, you know, you're looking at a hundred and uh, or thirty million uh, thirty million dollar, you know, basically pot of gold right now to run the PSTA. And of course with the switch out from the Avalorum taxes to the sales tax, it becomes a hundred and thirty million. Um the it, they predict that right off the bat because of the increased scheduling, the length of scheduling and the money, there could be upwards of 500 jobs almost immediately on the plate. Now, remember a lot of people don't do well as bus drivers in their jobs, which is why they have a lot of turnover, but the point is it would bring jobs, it would bring reasonable transportation uh, so that you know when maybe when you get out of a bar at 2 o'clock in the morning you could get to the bar and leave the bar on the bus but you can't do now because it's not there at that time when you're leaving. Same thing with the Rays games, and you know we kind of all know that this would be, you know, and and faster turnaround times on the bus routes. And do I think that would stop people from driving right away? No, but I'm a New York City girl, as you can probably tell. I grew up in the concrete jungle, so down the line we absolutely have to, you know, do this planning and, and create these initiatives. I would pose that it's going to take a while for people to let go of their cars and go on the bus, but the only way to start that process, which is necessary both environmentally and for sanity in a, in a crowded and, and a, a continually growing state of Florida, that we have to start, make it at least amenable to do so, and then we you know, start on the process of shifting mass transit rather than cars. The light rail component I know is a lot less kind of, you know, decided, and of course the Howard Franklin, uh, you know, redoing that part of the bridge, we, it, it, we absolutely have to have FDOT say yes to, you know, a rail component to that next stage, because really mass transit is not going to really work great unless it's regional, and we all know that. So not to say that we shouldn't get started, and not to say that I don't uh, support getting started, but I know we have a long way to go in planning, and it's going to take regional heads coming together to make it really, really work, hopefully 10, 15 years down the line. Okay. Um, you guys, you got any follow-up? I'd like to ask a, a question next. Um, okay, it's Leonard again. Uh, Lorraine, the, uh, my question is this, and it's essentially when, you, when, when reviewing a candidate, uh, uh, I mean uh, an incumbent, uh, could you tell us which decision that he made, or which vote you most agreed with on, and also the uh, contrast to that? Which one, you, which vote did you most uh, disagree with him on? Well, I think we know the vote I most disagreed with him on. There were many, but of course, the continued uh, assignation of dollars towards the Lens Project that was well known to be coming up for a vote which was well known by most people who actually were out on the street like I was uh, as opposed to my opponent knew that the referendum vote would sink that lens ship right quick. So I uh, think that the waste of 3.8 million dollars was an absolute sin. Now of course the first million I could have lived with, okay, but once the opposition and the reality of the scene on in our city where our city sat as a city 
in majority, in vast majority, in mandate majority, in my opinion, that money flow should have stopped and we could have saved a whole lot of money. So that was the decision, uh, one of the decisions. Uh, another one that really bothered me uh, is almost of equal level, less financial consequence, but uh, reflective of his priorities uh, as he views the budget was voting against the people's budget review. That was just, you know, for a couple of measly, a couple of hundred thousand, few hundred thousand dollars. And you know why that whole uh, people's budget review thing came into place is because really they're trying to encourage the county to finally vote for the CRA and the TIP funding. And the county is not going to go there unless the city puts a little skin in the game. And that's really what that was all about. And my opponent would not vote for just a little helping hand. Uh, even of three hundred thousand dollars in that final budget vote, and I thought that was just, you know, tone deaf to what can you know give some advantage and and hope in, in terms of these future plans to really try to do something for the Midtown area, Child's Park, and so forth. Uh, in in terms of what votes I agree with uh, that he's made, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I there's there's nothing that oh red light cameras that's um, I don't know. I mean, I have not thought about what I like about his votes. Well, so. I, I do know of one. I mean, he did a... Uh, he's also uh, in favor of Green Light Canal site, I believe. Um, isn't that right? Okay, so so I, I'm glad he supports Green Light Canal. Okay, that, that and, and what about this park that he's taken some credit for? Um, are, you, are you in favor of the park? Well, of course, I know a lot of people who live right around that park, and they are not happy about that park because it's really a very busy park. Uh, from the basketball fields to the run, I mean, there are people who live right right around the park who I've already spoken to who are not happy with it. Of course, you can imagine from my point of view, real green space that's not has lots of construction and more concrete and stuff is not always the best way to go, especially looking at it, that area and its configuration as where it's at. I would have loved to see a more passive scenario, but that really doesn't matter because it's a done deal and it's happening. Uh, but I would say if I had been looking at that, that park's uh, creation and working with the school board and moving that forward, and I understand why there might have been some more amenities that the, that the community wanted, in general, not the people who live right around it, uh, but I would not have felt comfortable about having such a congested, active park, knowing that the people who live in that neighborhood really treasure their peace and quiet. So, mm -hmm. so you have to have find a balance. Um, you know, as you probably know, at one point he wanted a dog park in there too, and the neighbors like screamed and they stopped that. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know. Less, less is more to me <clears throat> sometimes when you're looking at places where you have an escape piece, you can have some activity. I think the park in its configuration, I have seen the mapping, is incredibly congested and I don't know how that's going to work ultimately for the contiguous neighborhood. Okay, thank you Lorraine. I'll uh, pass the torch on to Doc, I guess. And if you could, uh, I can come in that room and help you because I'm in the same building with Lorraine, but uh, maybe turn your speakers down just a hair. I know you're not familiar with that laptop. So, uh, Gene, why don't you take over, and I will uh, work on that technical issue. Sure will, uh, Leonard. The, uh, uh, as you probably, I know, I'm sure you're aware, Lorraine, I was with the city for about 30 years on the senior staff, and probably the best eight years that I experienced when I was with the city of St. Petersburg was when Rick Baker was mayor and when we really developed a strong and vibrant and vital neighborhood association group, uh, Kona, and also the strong neighborhoods it took to, to build the city up. Uh, under Bill's administration, the neighborhoods have really languished. You know, they've, uh, Kona is now probably as, almost as ineffective as it was when, uh, when Mayor Baker was first elected. Uh, the question is, you know, what will you do or what will you attempt to do as a member of council to bring the neighborhoods back into the picture and to give them a bigger voice at the table. But um, can you still hear me? Because Len turned the volume yep. down a lot. Yep. So you can, I can barely hear you, but I'm just gonna turn up just a smidge. I'm like uh, I have 50% hearing loss. So anyway, 
Um, can you, you, you can hear me well, right? Yep. Okay, so neighborhood building. Um, well, I, the neighborhood partnership is the old neighborhood partnership department, which is now the community service organization. That's when things were. It was well staffed. I um, mean, of course, Susie Ahak is still at the head of whatever there is. There's, you know, basically no staff. Um, there's no. Uh, I mean, we've gone to no grant funding to, I guess now proposed thirty thousand dollar funding for neighborhood neighborhood partnership grants. Um, so what we need to do is restore or recreate, bring back the neighborhood partnership department as it was in the past, uh, which was staffed that when there were neighborhood team meetings, there would be the codes people there, you know, whatever relevant staff would be necessary to address neighborhood's partner uh, problems, they would be at the meetings. And how do I know this? Because I spent five, four years, five years on the uh, 34th Street Corridor neighborhood partnership team, which was a real team then, and we had really good attendance. And all of the neighborhoods, we, you know, were part of that team, which is what we created: Distant Heights, uh, you know, Historic Kenwood, North Kenwood, you know, blah blah blah, Central Oaks. We, you know, came to have a conglomeration of a huge part. No, uh, hang on one second, Maureen. Um, there you go. Sorry, uh, we lost your video for a second. Did you guys have a, a video loss as well? No, oh, no, it, uh, everything was fine. And, and yeah, good here. Keep going. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I for some reason the video feed was lost on my end for the link. So go ahead, Lenny. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I, unmute yourself. I think I muted you. Just uh, click on that uh, icon up in the corner. No, you're still not unmuted. Okay. Can, did you turn off your? Did you? Are you still on the mute button? Is the little red microphone? Just click on that microphone in the corner. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, it's good. Uh, excuse me for my train of thought being lost. If I have lost it, <laughs> <laughs> don't count it against me, please. Especially Phil. Anyway, uh, where were we? Somebody. Oh, we were talking about neighborhood partnership. Uh, Right, we were talking about strengthening neighborhood partnerships. So, you know, as I've said incessantly on the campaign trail, we need to build back up or restore that configuration of the neighborhood partnership department, which was really good when I was very active in that, you know, that whole issue. Um, neighborhood partnership grants. But I'll tell you, um, you know, the combination of community policing restoration. And, you know, a true effort. And I just saw Susie Ahok a couple of, maybe three or four weeks ago. I was at one of the, um, the CRA, the Southside CRA workshop meetings, uh, where we were talking about the green light Pinellas, actually. And that was a very good meeting to be at. I learned a lot. Uh, but uh, she was telling me, oh, you know, we're, we're going to start making a major outreach to the communities. Which let me know, and I know Susie, and I've worked with her many times over 20 years, that that hasn't been happening, and it has to happen. I mean, you know, you, you can be try to be a neighborhood leader, uh, but if you don't feel like you have that support system from the government, because it's hard, especially if you're tackling hard issues, ends up fizzling and going nowhere. And so that that's what we need to do: have staff help. No staff doesn't do it. It's got to eventually come from the citizens. But staff help is very good in forwarding. Uh, a neighborhood plan, and I better close the door because there's a whole bunch of people talking. Can you hear me, or is that interrupting or not? All right. Have a good day. Uh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I think, hear. I think they're just there's a couple of people are leaving work here. So they're so leaving work. Okay. I think I think you'll be fine um, if you just keep going. Okay, so um, that is my short answer, um, and then also the neighborhoods talking to each other. That helps. It really helps when different, you know, neighborhood presidents and their boards have their own meetings, uh, and you know, you can really go a long way to you know, solving neighborhood issues when everyone's cooperating. Everyone knows what everybody else's problem is, and you work together to solve those problems. Whether it's 
you know, foreclosed homes or whether it, one thing I've, I've really found out that's astounding me as I've been traveling across the city is I've been to so many meetings where people talk about, you know, foreclosed homes and, you know, people living in them and blah, 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 blah. And so then you'll say, well, did you call anybody? No. You know, our, our citizens have just lost that kind of step in and try to problem solve, not everyone, of course, but to a large degree, a different uh, a different uh, state of mind exists in the city. And the only one thing that's going to bring it up, give people hope, and then enable them to feel like volunteering means something is to help give more support from government to kind of reenact that spirit that I saw 15 years ago in the city and for the most part has sadly fallen by the wayside. Uh, who's up next? I think Phil. Okay. Um, now I know it's not part of your district, but uh, I want to hear your thoughts about Midtown. Um, speaking about foreclosures and such, I think that's a, a, a major problem in Midtown, or at least Carl Nurse says that there is a um, abandoned homes, um, foreclosed homes, things along those lines. What would your ideas be about bringing Midtown up and making them more of a, an economic development area? By the way, take a look at Meadow Lawn. Meadow Lawn's foreclosure situation is hard, too. Take a look at the yes. stats sometimes. Uh, I, it's not just Midtown. But anyway, moving on. Well, you know, one thing we could have been doing, which uh, remember that we had the Child's Park and the Midtown initiatives under the Baker administration. Remember when we went, went through that whole consulting thing? And basically, we got the streetscaping done, but the rest of the initiatives just got dropped like a hot potato. So um, it's sad that, you know, those kind of inset plans to do other, you know, kind of, uh, you know, helper manipulation of codes and a whole host of other things just stopped dead in its tracks after we planted a couple of trees. So, okay, that could still, you know, until we, because you know the Southside CRA and the TIF funding thing, we're really looking at maybe 10 years from now real money, although, you know, there, there can be some, bar, you know, pursuit of grant funding if and when we know the county says yes and you know you have that kind of leverage factor but right now we have nothing still so um, you know why not go back to the Child's Park and Midtown initiative the, it's all on paper lots of good ideas there and start going back and working on all the other parts but the tree planting uh, just to give a kickstarter to um, you know looking like we're doing something in Midtown again uh, foreclosures, of course, you know, the foreclosure registry only works when the banks actually own the house. And there, as you know, so many homes in that limbo where, uh, but, you know, I don't think people know this, and I know the people in Meadow Lawn didn't know this because I was just at a neighborhood association meeting and they're glad to know it. You know, if you call codes, um, they'll come and do some cleanup on these foreclosed homes that are still in that limbo. You know, no, no, no bank ownership, you can't go to, there's nobody to go to, right, to like right. do a cleanup. So, you know, and I'm sure a lot of folks in Midtown and Child's Park do not know that either. Now, needless to say, we probably need a bunch more codes people, but, you know, the foreclosure thing is really, really, really hard uh, because there are probably, in some senses, more than less homes that are, you know, you can go to the bank and put, you know, that foreclosure register mark on them get something out of the bank so you know what what can help with that further again community participation neighbor caring about neighbor neighbors caring enough to pick up the phone and call city codes or the mayor's action line or what have you and saying you know guess what down the block there's this foreclosed on home and there's a bunch of people living in there you know I'm just finding out that people are just not making the phone calls so you know that's a PSA that you know we need to find now, what I've been doing is I've been going around the city, I've been giving everyone my personal cell phone number and urging them that when I sit on council, you know, just call me. You don't have to go through, you know, the mayor's action line. You don't have to call one of the uh, city council secretaries called Kiwa or what have you. But just call me because I can probably get something done for you faster than you going through the whole circuitous route of city staff. Not to say that city staff is bad or good. It's just to say that's the truth. You know, you can march down the hall and say, okay, walk down the hall kindly. 
don't want to go uh, and say, you know, to whatever, you know, city department, hey, I got this call from, you know, Joe Brown and told me about these houses. Can you please, A, you know, go do what we can do as a city and then please report back to me so I can inform the constituent. If we had that kind of interaction, and I will say, you know, there are, well, not many, but I know my opponent is not one of those people. I've seen him in meeting after meeting after meeting when people have these voluminous complaints We'll just call blah 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 department instead of getting out a pad, writing down the situation, the complainant's name and phone number, and taking care of it. You know, if all of our city council did that as they went around, so, well, and, and you know, and go to other neighborhood meetings, not just your district. You know, you would that would be a way, and I and I bet you this new a lot of this new city council will be like that. You know, go out not only to their own neighborhood meetings and issues regularly, but go out to the other meetings in other parts of the city. So much of what we vote on has an impact to the entire city, not just your district. So um, being in communication, uh, being a boots on the ground, you know, informant, <laughs> shall you know, being that that font for information and making sure that that you know the backup that comes from the city has been taken care of. You know, it takes a lot of work and time, but that's what our job is. Our job is to, you know, be that that uh, interface between the citizens and how our city services function as legislators. So, um, well, so we're going back to Midtown, right? I boy, did I like go off on a wild hair. I'm sorry, but it really it's all so okay. Going back to the Midtown, excuse me, please, but I'm very passionate about what I'm not seeing happening in the city. So Midtown. Uh, uh, Charles Park Midtown initiatives. Um, not only the directly associated <coughs> city councilors, but everyone, uh, all of city council going and listening as I have now been for the last months at churches, at neighborhood meetings, uh, you know, everywhere. I'll tell you what, the spirit of volunteerism and service is there in Midtown. I'm telling you, it's there. We're just not connecting to it and making the folks out there feel like they've been struggling for years and years and years. I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, there's a lot of people that I worked with that I couldn't believe are still neighborhood association presidents from 15, 20 years ago because no one else will step up to the plate. And they saw me and they're like, yay! <laughs> you know, and like, someone is really going to listen to us. And, you know, that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. You know what? You listen and you do a little something, then that mm -hmm. whole thing just, you know, broils up on its own. And then you have the neighborhood again working together. So yeah, the right, let me let me jump in and add a, a, a little bit to uh, Phil's question uh, related to uh, well, basically foreclosed homes of our residents in St. Petersburg. Uh, I mean, records have been broken in the last four years nationwide on foreclosures, particularly in in, in Florida and in the Tampa Bay area and in St. Pete. So. There's, there's a severe problem. Now, there's generally a philosophy that, uh, or dueling philosophies. Most people agree that the free market, private commercial banks should take care of uh, mortgages and the government should not get too involved, even though FHA loans and so on were set up with government guarantees. Um, I don't know where I heard this number, but I'd also heard at some point 5,000 foreclosures in St. Petersburg. If any of you uh, have anything to add on that, I don't. Maybe that's accurate. Maybe it's way off. But um, here's the thing: so Bank of America owns a lot of those mortgages, and they are uh, the the primary bank for the city of St. Petersburg. And they've been punished. They've, they've been convicted. Essentially, they've been caught doing things uh, terribly wrong. And I just don't understand. Uh, why our citizenry should be, or why our city should be using our tax money to support a corporation that has really not acted in good faith. Now, Mayor Foster, I, I brought this question up, or a similar question, uh, during a mayoral forum, and they said it would be difficult to unweave our relationship with Bank of America. Well, I mean, that's true with any business, but uh, difficult doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. They're supposed to bring this up. It'll probably come to a vote. Should you get elected, you'll be voting on it. And regardless of the difficulties, uh, specifically, would you vote to terminate the relationship with Bank of America? And that's an easy one to answer. Uh, as you all know, I am in foreclosure defense, and my bank is Bank of America. 
So yeah, Bank of America is not friendly to its customers. It does not care about you, um, and you, you know you, you you just you have no personal contact. Yeah, yes, I have a lawyer now, but you know the point is, uh, I would definitely consider looking at that. I don't think that that's a you know it would be so much nicer if some of our you know regional or more local banks. And the reason I know that is actually I'm working with some of them now, including my campaign, right? I, I, I you know, like a Freedom Bank or a Regions. There's just a whole different level of connection. Now, you know, who, who would some of the same problems end up being the same problems if they got bigger and bigger? I mean, that's not going to happen with Freedom Bank. But yes, I understand what you're saying. That you know, would I consider switching banks because of Bank of America's hard record? Simple answer is yes. Okay, well, to follow up on that, I'm actually, you know, um, I'm assuming you've considered that. What I'm asking for is, with the information you have now, would you, is your vote basically defaulting to, yeah, we terminate doing business with Bank of America and find a local bank unless there's some extreme circumstances forcing us to stay with Bank of America? So, so you're asking me a yes or no answer to that question. I'm, I'm basically asking you to commit to um, not doing business uh, with Bank of America. Uh, um, I can, I'm not well studied on the subject, so that would be not an honest commitment of mine to tell you 100% Leonard Schmiege. Okay, that's I will, all right. But, but because I mean I haven't you know I haven't done the research on. Now, admittedly, I know the dysfunctionality in that bank and how it treats its customers. So I, mo I absolutely would look at that in a very serious manner. I'm not going to make a commitment to anyone on a subject that I haven't studied seriously yet. And okay. I think that's and now fair. So that, that's fair. And our follow-up would be uh, back to the philosophy question. If the private market is having problems um, and, and giving out what turned out to be bad loans and not essentially credentialing the, the people they were lending money to carefully enough. Um, what can the city, could, can the city of St. Petersburg itself do something? Can it, can it like, uh, for example, I think it's Riverview, California, they're using eminent domain to capture homes or, or to um, buy out homes that are in foreclosure from those banks and then they're basically reselling them to either the homeowner that's already living in that home under foreclosure, but now the mortgage has been refinanced at a reasonable rate. I what think that eminent domain that? is not is off the books. I don't think you can eminent domain anymore. Am I not right, Simon? Out there? No, can you, you can. Leonard, the federal laws. Leonard, am, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, hang on. We we have a, a guest who's been following along. Um, uh, this is uh, Chris. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. You're uh, you're up. I've been working uh, some attorneys in Tarpon Springs on an ISIN code enforcement board to take housing banks and then resell them by using the housing authority uh, can issue bonds uh, for the homes and then sell them back. So this is a mechanism. That, uh, in my view, simpler than using eminent domain, and I believe that St. Petersburg can do this. And I would simply offer that up to you to investigate, um, work with your foreclosure attorney about this, uh, and this is something that the city can be pushed into doing. Essentially, taking away—they do this already. Code enforcement can code violate us and take away uh, the property from a bank. So. I offer that up. Invest. See if you can get your city to do that. Uh, it's definitely something we will keep track of. Uh, I think. What could you all hear, uh, Chris? Okay. I, yes. I'm hearing a lot of feedback, but I don't know if anybody else is. But that doesn't matter to me. I can hear it. It's more hard. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and mute Chris out. That could be where it's coming from. Um, Chris, you can unmute yourself if you need to. Um, all right, let's go. Keep going here. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left in our scheduled time. Uh, I guess uh, Gene, um, if you want to, or if anybody wants to follow up on that question or ask the next question on your on your list, uh, go ahead. 
Sure. Uh, where I'd like to go next is this whole issue of uh, schools. We've heard a lot about uh, schools and the problems with failing schools here in St. Petersburg. Uh, we obviously have a number of problem schools in St. Pete. So fully understanding that city council and the mayor really doesn't have any direct authority over the school system as, as it exists. We saw under the Baker administration that, in fact, if interest is expressed and, and, and programs are developed, the actual influence of city government can be fairly significant. My question is, uh, with this number of problem schools that we have in St. Pete, specifically what would you do to help improve those schools? Well, again, the only thing that we can do is try to offer after-school programs and help via our recreation centers or other formats like that to supplement what is not happening in schools. So, um, you know, all of the mentoring and, and all of those things are, and we can also pressure our, our school board members who we get to know to, you know, try to make some significant changes in how the management system is going. But realistically, um, and, and there is a lot of discussion uh, on this, particularly in Midtown, about you know, again, support using private entities, but perhaps some support from the city level to um, partner in offering after-school programming and help via recreation centers, the Sanderlin centers, and you know, all of the different other locations that there might be possibilities for gathering to give that supplemental support uh, to students when they're out of school. Uh, what you know really it's the school board who's going to make decisions what's happening in school other than talking about it a lot and using as much of your voice as a legislator as you can to point out the problems uh, that are you know but but as most of us know I mean the problems are coming into the school you know kids either not eating or not having you know the proper uh, support at home and that's where we can come in and help a lot in that backup support system uh, which leads to a lot of the problems in certain of our troubled schools. I mean it's kids coming in with a big disadvantage and uh, you know our teaching side. I, I, let me tell you a little story. Uh, I was an artist in residence for nine years in Pinellas County and Hillsborough County schools. Uh, Phil you probably don't know but I think you know the rest of the folks here know that you know I, I was a musician for 36 years and I introduced Japanese taiko drumming to the Tampa Bay region. Who knew? But anyway, through that process, I had a 501c3 and I went in and taught kids using the uh, art of Japanese taiko drumming to try to reach kids, particularly ones who were disadvantaged or who were supposedly problem children. There is not, I saw over 250,000 kids in that nine years here in Hillsborough. There was not a class I ever went into, kindergarten through 12 where the teacher did not tell me one, two, or more kids needed to be pulled out of the class before I came in to teach. Of course, I would always say, no, that's exactly the kid I want to reach and would have them kept in. We have a culture in our, and, and I've heard it's even worse because I've talked to, you know, some teachers and people who are, you know, parents and volunteering in the schools a lot. You know, when in every classroom, you know there's going to be a couple of kids that the teacher has already dismissed, you know, as a possibility for advancement. That that tenor, that that whole atmosphere creeps into the entire system. Um, you know, I would like teach kids who are, you know, 22 and had knifed a couple of teachers, you know, and I'd be like in the back trailer. And when I was done with them, they'd be uh, at the time I was Mrs. Compton. Uh, Mrs. Compton, let me help you carry out your drum. It's a big Taiko drum, right? Giant drum. And the teacher's aides would be like, no, no, in the background, no, don't go out there in the parking lot. And and I would, of course, you know, say, please, you know, come and help me. Thank you for offering. And they come out and say, you're the first person who's respected me in years, who trusted me in years. So how to feed that, you know, if the atmosphere exchange. And, you know, that could be a lot of mentoring help, a lot of community to support help coming into the schools, you know, teachers aides who are volunteers, you know, that that's that's a big, big task to take on, but um, it is symptomatic and very prevalent in our school system here and across the Bay that, you know, there are attitudes formed about kids that just make, turn those kids into worse kids or more misbehaving kids, less learning kids. Um, 
and I would almost like to see how you know city government could try to interact with those teachers through a partnership and try to find the way for more respect and more understanding and more true helpfulness to come into the classroom which would then I think alleviate a lot of or a significant amount of learning problems when there was trust when there was a buildup of kids instead of a you don't count anymore attitude which goes on every single classroom I ever went in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about uh, how about you, Phil? Well, let me turn to the um, flood insurance issue. Um, the big uh, now there seems to be legislature in um, in Congress that's going to put a four-year moratorium on the rate increases from Biggert's Water. Um, I just wanted to know if what are your feelings about how the city of St. Petersburg specifically could have either done something differently or kind of stemmed off this situation that seemed to have taken a lot of people by surprise. Well, got, nobody was paying attention from you know from this, the municipal level up to the Fed. So you know, guilty as charged, everyone. Um, but here's what I think is not being remembered by everyone in this discussion: whether it's delayed a couple of years or not, it's coming. Sea level rise is coming. So, uh, and that happens to be part of my platform to address that. It was really funny when they, uh, you, Yuli, I was at the Vinoy. A meeting where the Urban Land Institute kind of gave their beginning plan for, for the waterfront. And every one of them talked about sea level rise. And, you know, so I was sitting right in back of council and, you know, looking kind of the heads like, sea level rise? You know, we have to think about that for, for developing our waterfront. But we have to think about that period because, you know, what I think is probably going to have to end up happening, what we should be doing right now is re looking at our entire stormwater project budget, okay? whatever we're planning to do around the city for the next 10, 15 years, however far it stretches out, and see where we can, speaking of eminent domaining, it might not be eminent domaining, but probably what's going to happen is there are certain parts of our city that not only cannot be rebuilt structurally, but might have to be removed structurally to create um, you know, a reconfiguring of the land to save the other housing stock around it. Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, um, you know, just putting off the charges, and then there's another component too, but, you know, we can't just look at the money factor, we have to look at the reality of sea level rise. be glad to share with any of you the NOAA slider that shows what's coming to the city's, not just the city's coast, but our coast, over, you know, by 2050. And, of course, there's a lot of projects that are coming on the table that will be, you know, encompassing that 2050 level. Uh, and it will just scare. I, I showed it to Carl Nurse actually about a month and a half ago, and he emailed me back and said, "This is scared the heck out of me." And I said, "No, you need to understand that that slider scale is not even accounting for sea uh, Arctic ice melt." I spoke to the actual NOAA scientists, and I am connected with a lot of them, who put together the slider scale with the engineering lead on it. And he said, and I said, "Boy, I haven't seen much. You know, in the, it was like in January. We heard a whole lot about it. Kind of went dead." And he said. Well, because we realized we messed up. I said, we messed up? He said, um, what we have on the slider scale is probably low end. It's probably going to be much worse. Mm -hmm. So, if you're, and you have to know that the president's um, uh, climate initiative, I don't know if any of you read it. It came out, what, in February, I think? Mm -hmm. The climate change initiative and planning. Well, I don't know if you all noticed, but, you know, federal funding uh, aid going to direct coastal building has gone away. Okay, because the feds acknowledge that we can't be really building much on our coasts anymore. So you're looking at insurance issues coming down the pike, whether it's now two years or four years from now. Real issues in, you know, in, Bra in Dade Broward County right now, there is already five mile intrusion of brackish water into their aquifer. Okay, that's coming our way too. We have to look at our water system infrastructure, water sewage treatment. Um, and, you know, just basic the land configuration within, you know, the, the sewer management funding, uh, which, by the way, can also help alleviate for other parts of the city and housing stock these flood issues coming down the pike. So this is, you know, right now it's another simple, oh, we'll hold it, you know, we'll hold off on this again bullet. 
there's a lot more to think about. I can, I'm already thinking about it. Um, I am already been talking to some people in terms of trying to form a St. Petersburg cat catastrophic fund. Um, and there is kind of a sort of a plan that I've ID'd. I can't really uh, release it. I didn't think of it, but I found it. And some really smart people came up with this. Actually, they proposed it at the state level six years ago, but it still exists, the plan. Um, and so, yes, bigger waters counts, even if we get off the hook for this year. Bigger waters is still, and, and you know, the, uh, the, the sea level rise component of why this all is coming down the pike is a number one issue on the sea's plate, and I can guarantee you that I will certainly be thinking about it. Uh, my opponent's solution to that was, oh, we're building 16 sewer vaults in Riviera Bay. He's actually said that at meetings. That was his answer to trying to alleviate bigger water. So I can definitely guarantee you I know a lot more about the subject, and I will be a much stronger advocate to make sure we're paying attention from this point forward on sea level rise and the um, you know kind of federal uh, things coming down the pike that are going to negate any help for coastal building, and you know conversely readjusting our our landscape to save some more housing stock from that impending sea level rise. Excellent. Well, listen, everyone, we have um, uh, about two minutes left on our schedule here because we're going to wrap this up at six o'clock. Um, so I guess we have one remote viewer. We have Chris, who's actually under his wife's account, has has participated. A bit. He was one of the one question that we didn't see his uh, face. And um, I guess we have closing comments. I'd like everybody to please mention your your website and your blog again. And um, if uh, any any final comments, and then I will wrap up. With the uh, with the big, you know, I'll, I'll just say we're going to try to do this again. Um, I thought it went pretty well after uh, after we got the, some of the technical issues uh, sort of. So let's go in the same order and just close out the comments. And thank you, thank you very much for everybody and your participation. I really appreciate it all. Thank you. Well, let me begin by just uh, thanking Lorraine, uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, and you can read this at the bottom of all my uh, political posts on both Patch and Bay Post Internet, uh, I disclose all my campaign contributions and those I'm supporting, and I'm supporting uh, Lorraine because I think uh, she's the right person for the job, and we need somebody there that's uh, going to do a little bit more than snooze on the dais. Um, Again, thanks to St. Pete Polis for putting this together. It was an honor for me to be part of the very first one. I hope I get the opportunity to come back and do some more. I'd like to wish uh, Lorraine uh, the very best in the election. Uh, and it's been a pleasure having the opportunity to sit here with you gentlemen and ask some questions today. Thanks again, Leonard. Great. Yes, thank you again, Leonard. Thank you again, Lorraine. Really appreciate this uh, opportunity. And. Um, just want to say I, I write for uh, St. Peter's blog, and uh, I do my own own blogging on uh, HR News Daily, but you can catch most of it on St. Peter's blog. And again, I really uh, now that we've got all the little technical glitches out of the way, I think it went really well. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Lorraine. Am I up? Okay. Um, I I want to thank you all for spending so much time with me. It was so nice to not to have more than 30 seconds to answer a question. And for me as a candidate, a format like this is priceless. I hope you can catch a few more before November 5th. I don't know if any will be willing. Uh, but it, it, was, it was a conversation. And it was a conversation where you could continue to question me further, and I could continue to elicit more of what you needed to hear from me. And it was really, really much better than even your typical, you know, media interview. Because, um, hey, I want to thank and and Len and Shadow. It's Shadow actually behind this, right? Len, not St. Pete Paul's. Oh, well, St. Pete a little of a little of each. A little both, I'm okay, a combo yeah, thing. But mm -hmm. uh, again, my name is Lorraine Marchison. I'm running for City Council District Two, and I would, I, as a citizen, I would love to see every politician that I need to vote for go through a scenario like this because this was much, much better and hopefully gave the viewers, whoever does view this, a better 
understanding of what I know or don't know or what I'm honest enough to say and propose to the city uh, as you know my promises my promises are I won't be sleeping on the dais that's for sure <laughs> thanks votelorainemargeson.com well thank you very much uh, all of you and particularly you Lorraine our first guest on this uh, little social experiment that we've been doing uh, that we've just started, uh, and in disclosure, you have been a customer at St. Pete Polls, and we do robocalls and polling, and I do sales for St. Pete Polls, and that uh, St. Pete Polls was started by Matt Florell, and they have a much larger company behind that that does corporate phone systems called Fextel. So it's thanks to St. Pete Polls that I get to spend my afternoon working on this here. Um, now, Shadow Votes uh, basically a civics project where we want to uh, track our elected officials, sort of quote shadow shadow their votes and so on. And you can and you can check your voter record, and you can get on our uh, email list at shadowvote.org, and maybe we'll we'll have some more things like this. Um, this particular show um, and is is we may be able to. I talked to Steve Galvin, another candidate. We might be able to fit him in before the election if everybody has time. And the other thing I'd really like to do is a show on the pier with local architects and everybody involved in the pier. And another disclosure thing, Lorraine was had worked for Stop the Lens, which was a group uh, actually concerned citizens of St. Petersburg. And um, they they work to uh, prevent the uh, to get a vote on the lens, which was which was passed, and that's why we have a lot more interest in what's going to happen with the peer going forward. And may I just so, mention briefly, if I can, shortly, because uh, Phil and and Jean don't know this. I, I met with Mesh Architecture today, uh, who are the uh, architectural firm that have put a. Uh, rehab of the pier on the plate in budget or less than budget. Uh, I believe some of those uh, design photos are coming soon and they're going to blow your socks off. That's all I have to say. Uh, stay tuned. Okay, everyone. A final thank you very much. Really appreciate your time today. And uh, let's let people know about the next one and we'll have a few live viewers. Maybe we'll try a few shows and see how this works out. Have a great Excellent. day. See Great. you.